Okay, tonight, if my notes are correct, we broke off the last time in the end of chapter 12. We had uh, chapter uh, 10 and 11 and uh, the, the brief psalm that makes up chapter 12. And so we're in Isaiah chapter 13, and probably we'll get into part of 14. Isaiah is a fun guy. He has such variety. There's the dirge of judgment one moment and then an incredible messianic glimpse the next. Chapter 13 and 14 are also embody some surprises of sorts, a very different kind. I believe that uh, I assigned as homework for those of you that were inclined to take on an assignment, the reading of three pairs of chapters, which if you haven't done, let me have you annotate that now. And by the way, if you're those who are taking notes, know that the Chuck Mister Bible study, Acts 17.11, goes in the upper right-hand corner. Acts 17.11 is where Luke tells you not to believe anything Chuck Mister tells you, but to check it out for yourself, in effect. So that certainly applies tonight, because we're going to go out into some, you know, pretty strange territory. Chapter 13 deals with the city of Babylon. In fact, I should say more precisely, the Babylonian Empire, not just the city, but in the context of the Babylon Empire. And uh, this is a widely misunderstood chapter. What I would like you to do, if you haven't done it, and case, uh, we obviously won't cover it all tonight, those of you that are serious about your learning the Bible, I encourage you at one sitting, not in, in pieces, in one sitting, I'd like you to read six chapters. Take you 20 minutes, probably. I'd like you to read Isaiah 13 and 14. People winced at that. I guess you have to read as fast as I talk. Huh? Yeah. Several people have complained about my speaking too slowly, but... Um, no? Okay. Isaiah 13 and 14 is the first pair of chapters. Jeremiah 50 and 51 are the second pair of chapters. And Revelation 17 and 18 being the third pair. In other words, six chapters, but in three pairs. But read them all at one sitting, because there's something that you will gain that way that will be far more profound than my sort of summarizing it for you. What you will experience is, on the one hand, the clear perception that all six chapters are talking about the literal city of Babylon. Not Rome, exactly. The city of Babylon, the pride of the Chaldeans, the city on the, in the plain of Shinar, a literal city of Babylon. The idioms of all six chapters, it pervades all six chapters. And so we must be careful not to allegorize Babylon. And we're talking a literal Babylon. On the one hand, on the other hand, especially in the Revelation passages, there's something else going on, far more profound than just the city of Babylon, something else. And you need to savor that for yourself and come to your own inferences and conclusions. We'll talk about some of that at the end, but just to give you a prelude of one, that's why I want you to read all six at one sitting. So the voice of each of those three writers, Isaiah and Jeremiah and John, will be in your ear so you can see the consistency of idiom. And there's many uh, issues there. But uh, we're going to jump into Isaiah 13 and part of 14 tonight. And as we do, I want to anticipate some of the key points to be on the alert for. History talks about the fall of Babylon, meaning the fall of the Babylonian Empire. The city of Babylon is going to rise to power and decline. And we have the famous fall of Babylon. The Bible talks about the destruction of Babylon, and nine out of ten commentators confuse the two. That is, think they're the same thing. For a number of reasons that will emerge from this study tonight, you will discover that this has a lot to do with Saddam Hussein, the Persian Gulf crisis so far, and it's not over yet, and what's going to be unfolding over the next few months, few years, whatever. And I'm going to suggest to you that CNN and the other media have no idea what's going on. And you will, if you understand what the Bible says about the city of Babylon. The issue is not Baghdad, it's 62 miles south to something the commentators haven't even mentioned. And we'll see why as we go. Isaiah has been talking so far in the judgments we've read in chapters 10 and so on of the Assyrian Empire. Reigned over the earth for 700 years. Capital was Nineveh. And um, at the time that Isaiah was writing, Assyria captured the northern kingdom of Israel, the house of Israel, in contrast to Judah that Isaiah is focusing on. And the Assyrian threat 
terrified Judah. And so Isaiah had two burdens. On the one hand, to describe that God would be using Assyria to judge the northern kingdom, but also to give them comfort that despite the threat, that Assyria was not to conquer the southern kingdom. And we saw that very dramatically in the chapter 10 and so on last time. What's strange about Isaiah focusing on the, dis- on the destruction of Babylon, which he's about to, is that the time Isaiah is writing, Babylon hadn't even risen to a power yet. He wrote about 100 years before all that happened. The Assyrian Empire conquered the northern kingdom on about 722 B.C. Nebuchadnezzar makes his famous rise, the Battle of Karshemesh, at 606 B.C., in other words, over 100 years later. You follow me? So it's interesting. I want you to be, to be sensitive to the burden of, of, of Isaiah's readers because he's talking about a, a destruction of something that hasn't grown big enough to destruct. You follow me? The time Isaiah is writing, Babylon is a, a pawn of Assyrian politics. It's a city down south, southern lower Mesopotamia, what you and I would call southern Iraq as opposed to Nineveh, which would be up in the northern part of Iraq or Syria, depending on how you cut things. So the city of Babylon. Now, the point that I'm going to make, though, by the way, is that the language here goes far beyond that which not only Isaiah and his followers, but also modern commentators have perceived. But before we get into that, let me also talk a little bit about ancient Babylon, because you and I can't help but have rather quaint ideas about what Babylon really was all about. Babylon at its peak, ancient Babylon at its peak, was a city roughly, not quite square, roughly rectangular, over 15 miles on a side. It was cut at, not quite in half by the river Euphrates. Not quite diagonally, not quite in half, but sort of a little, from slightly northwest uh, entry and exit slightly east of south. In other words, cutting through the rectangular city. It had double walls, and as the river went through the city, it also was diverted to fill a moat. Okay? And that was a primary defense. But let's talk about this wall. Herodotus tells us it was 350 feet high at its highest points, 87 feet thick. They used to race six chariots abreast. So that's, you know, when you think of an ancient city, we often think of the ruins, as the quaint ruins that we visit in the Middle East. Or Babylon was, was uh, well, it was the world empire. 250 towers, some of them 100 feet higher than the wall. And, of course, had several temples, the Tower of Bel, which is Akkadian for Baal, as we know it in the Old Testament, and Marduk or Merodach, if you will, from the Old Testament. The palace of Nebuchadnezzar, they have uncovered and incidentally rebuilt. It uh, had a courtyard that's, virtually 200 feet by 170 feet. That's a large courtyard by today's standards. And I know you're saying real estate was cheaper then. Okay, but the throne room of Nebuchadnezzar was, as they found, and since has been reconstructed, is 165 feet long and 143 feet wide. And the very room that the famous handwriting of the wall has been built today, and Saddam Hussein, at least prior to the 100-hour war, used to use it for affairs of state. There was a major receptions there in 87 and so on. And, of course, the several key towers, the Tower of Esagelia, which is the house of him whose head is raised up, and also the Tower of Ektamani Anke, which we sometimes think is a, a vestige, if you will, of the Tower of Babel of Genesis 11, the home of the foundation of the heaven and the earth. And you know the story. The, the thing you should also do, and I won't get into tonight in the interest of time, is understand Babylon's origin. Genesis 10, the first world dictator, who I believe scholars believe was a black man, by the way, in deference to our guest. Nimrod, first world dictator, founded several cities, and of course Babylon being one of them, or Babel, and the Tower of Babel and the whole narrative in Genesis 11 starts a history of a city who spiritually symbolizes the city of man, or if you will, the city of Satan. And while Babylon has its ups and downs, its spiritual role is unchanged. It is the city of man. And you can talk. And there's another city that emerges in Genesis 14. Very early, just a hint, but it starts there, a city called Jerusalem. Melchizedek is the first place, uh, first one that appears there. The city of Jerusalem emerges in the scripture in early Genesis. And the story in the entire Bible can be viewed as a tale of two cities, the city of man, Babylon, and the city of God, Jerusalem. Now, don't misunderstand. Both cities have their ups and downs, and we're not here to extol Jerusalem, other than its role in the Bible spiritually. 
is the city of God. And both of them start in Genesis. Both of them are climaxed in Revelation, Babylon being judged and the Jerusalem being replaced by the heavenly Jerusalem, which is a whole other study, of course. But the point is, the Scripture almost uses these two cities symbolically, antithetically one to another. Well, let's jump in, and let's untangle a little bit about we know, what we know about Babylon. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 1, the burden of Babylon, the Masa, the burden. We still use that term today, heavy, right? You know what I mean, right? Watch what Isaiah is saying. This is heavy. It's the burden of Babylon. It's not an extol extolling or exalting or raising up. It's the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. And again, this is not Amos the prophet, different Amos, different, total different spelling in the Hebrew, both first and last letters are different. So don't confuse Amos, the father of Isaiah, it has nothing to do with Amos the prophet. In fact, they're opposite in many ways. Amos was man of the field, rural. Isaiah was the man of the court, and uh, so on. Verse 2, lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones... I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. Well, we don't have to untangle that phrase very much to say that if this is God speaking, something ominous is about to happen. I have commanded my sanctified ones, whoever they are. I have called, also called my mighty ones to minister, to comfort. No. For mine anger. You know, we glibly use these words. The idea of God being angry is a little terrifying. Even them that rejoice in my Ida. So something's about to spring, and it's far more than some local political uprising or downfalling or whatever. Verse 4, the noise of a multitude in the mountains as of a great people. A tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. Wait a minute, friends. Kingdoms of nations. Already, to the extent we know something about Babylon, this doesn't quite fit. Let me pause. Somewhere in here I need to pause, and I'll, I'll just choose arbitrarily right now to talk, get to remind you a little bit of the history of Babylon. Babylon was a city-state of Assyria. Along the way, a guy emerges. His father is appointed king of uh, the city of Babylon, and uh, this young guy is the father's general. The young guy's name is Nebuchadnezzar. He and his father, incidentally, emerged from a land which is called in the ancient nomenclature the Sea Lands, the marshlands of the south. If you look at a map and look at where Babylon was, what was to the south? The place you and I would call Kuwait, interestingly enough. There are several things that emerge out of Kuwait. Nebuchadnezzar and his father will be prominent in our tale in a moment, being one of them, or a couple of them. There's also a guy that emerged in that area from the tribe of Kedar, the second son of Ishmael, by the name of Muhammad, who in the, in the 600s gave us Islam. And we'll hear a lot more about those two billion members of Islam before history plays out much further. And a third character that surfaces on the scene, not in that class, don't misunderstand me, but still it's interesting to notice that another guy had emerged out of the tribe of Kedar that originated in Kuwait was a guy by the name of Saddam Hussein. And so that's kind of interesting. The tale thickens, huh? Yes. Okay, so Babylon starts to rise. Nebuchadnezzar's generalship is excellent. He knocks over a few other cities. The two main powers left on his horizon at the time as he rises, this is about a century after Isaiah's writing, this is, a, is in the six, 606 B.C. they're meaning up to rather than 722 B.C., uh, Nebuchadnezzar conquers uh, not only the Assyrians, but also at the time, which was also rising in power, the Egyptians. And there is a very key battle in ancient history known as the Battle of Carchemish, 606 B.C., where Nebuchadnezzar defeats Pharaoh Necho, and that battle is the, sort of the milestone that establishes Babylon as the dominant world empire. It rises to power. And Nebuchadnezzar not only defeats Pharaoh Necho, he also lays siege to Jerusalem the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the prophets had been predicting, and I'm not just talking about Isaiah, primarily Jeremiah and Ezekiel had uh, told Israel, I should say Judah, the southern kingdom, the Israel had long been captured, the southern kingdom, kingdom of Judah, 
that God was going to judge them too, just like their, their northern neighbors. The northern neighbors went into idolatry. God judged them. Judah didn't learn the lesson. The prophets preached. They wouldn't listen. They also go into idolatry. God decides to judge them. The reason he judges them is also kind of interesting. Among the many violations that the, at Judah did not, they did not keep the law, they did not obey God. Among the things that they did not obey is they did not keep the Sabbath of the land. You and I know the Sabbath of the week, the Sabbath for man. Six days you work, the seventh you rest. That was the Sabbath week for man, the Sabbath for man. There was also a Sabbath for the land. Six years you plowed the land, the seventh year you let it lie. And they were supposed to do that. They didn't do that. They didn't do that for 490 years. And God says, you owe me 70. So you're going to go into slavery into Babylon for 70 years. And the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar starts a period of time called the servitude of the nation, where the nation Israel is enslaved to Babylon for 70 years. And by the way, they are slaved to Babylon for 70 years to the very day. It's just kind of interesting. But that's just, we're just getting warmed up here. Nebuchadnezzar finds out that his father's died, so he goes back to Babylon, not just as general, but now as king. Young guy, inherits the old court guard, and what he does at in Jerusalem, he captures Jerusalem, but he puts in a vassal king, Jehoiakim, and um, he takes some hostages. He cherry-picks the best young men for postgraduate school to serve the Babylonian court, and that's where Daniel and his three friends are included. And I believe Ezekiel at that time was also enslaved. There was a number that he took, including the temple vessels. He puts those in his museum. Just north of his palace, there's a museum. He was accustomed to taking those artifacts of his captured peoples and displaying them in the museum, and he does that. And they'll appear in our tale in a few moments. When he gets back home, he, gets, he inherits this palace guard. He has a problem. He doesn't know if these guys can cut it or not. These old men that served his father, who are they? Nebuchadnezzar has a dream one night that really bothers him. Strange dream. So next morning, he calls all his advisors together and says, I want you guys to interpret my dream for me. And by the way, to see if you guys can cut the mustard, I want you to tell me what the dream was and what it means. Well, they don't, they don't particularly relate to that. That's not the way it works, King. Well, we, you tell us your dream and we'll interpret it for you. We have people like that today that'll run their meter and tell you what your dreams mean. Probably just as effective, I don't know. Anyway, so the king says, no, you don't understand my professional development program. If you don't tell me what the dream was and what it means, you're going to be all killed. He explained it to him a little more clearly. I think the actual King James says, I'll tear you limb from limb and make your houses a dunghill, or words to that effect. So they say, no man on earth can do what you're asking. And they're right, by the way. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no problem. You know, off with their head, in effect. And... Uh, Daniel happens to be in that job description. So when the word comes out that that particular classification of employment has just been eliminated, very literally, Daniel says, wait a minute, time out, boss. Uh, give me an audience to the king, and we'll give him the answer he wants. Now, that's guts. I don't know how many of you have that much confidence in prayer as Daniel did, but he called his buddies together and says, hey, let's have a prayer meeting. And he and his three friends pray. And when they get the audience to the king, Daniel reveals what the prayer was and what it means. That's all in Daniel chapter 2, and I'm obviously being rather cavalier in my summary of it. But by the way, uh, we won't take the time to go into detail because it reads like a, a, a shooting script. It's incredibly, uh, the first six chapters of Daniel are the narrative of his incredible life, and the last six are various visions he had. And I commend that to your study. He was a teenager, deported, very bright, very faithful to the God of Israel, what makes Daniel chapter 2 so valuable to us, it's one of those rare places, there's only a few in the Bible, where God gives us an overview of Gentile history. Most of Bible prophecy as it is about how things impact God's chosen people, the nation Israel. You normally see the Gentile world only as it impinges on Israel, but Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 and a few other places are exceptions. Daniel chapter 2, this dream that Nebuchadnezzar has, lays out all of world history from Nebuchadnezzar until... God sets up his own government on the earth. Fascinating chapter, something you must, as a ser if you're serious about Bible study, you need to study that. We'll, we'll move on. Incidentally, Daniel's a teenager in chapter 2. Late in his life, Daniel himself gets directly a series of visions in Daniel chapter 7. Very different idioms, but the same content laid out. Again, all Gentile history, and commands our attention for that reason. And of course, uh, Daniel upstages all these other advisors, so you can imagine how popular he was among those guys, right? 
And so they take an occasion, of course, to get Nebuchadnezzar on an ego trip. And Nebuchadnezzar's dream, of course, dealt with this big image. So they talk him into building one all of gold. And, and you know the story of Daniel 3 and the fiery furnace. And you can read it. It's pretty straightforward. By the way, Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, was saved. I believe his testimony, where there's a chapter in the Bible written by a Gentile king. It's chapter 4 of Daniel, written by Nebuchadnezzar himself and published throughout the entire world. And it's his testimony. But be that as it may, uh, Nebuchadnezzar eventually passes away. And after a couple of other uh, episodes, the kingdom is split between two, the father and the son. The son is Belshazzar, a profligate son, who is uh, running the kingdom at a time that another world empire is on the rise to the east, the Persians. The Persians make a coalition with the Medes. And there's a whole fascinating person in history by the name of Cyrus, how he rises to power by really shrewd effectiveness. And he has a general by the name of Ugaburu that is his, his shrewd uh, maneuver. And uh, they are the threat to Babylon from the east. They knock off a few of the peripheral cities, which doesn't look that serious to Belshazzar, the, the, king, the then king of Babylon, but it does give them control of the canal system in Babylon, which was a major national asset. And while the Persians are a threat, Belshazzar is not only not preparing in his arrogance, he chooses to throw a party rather than get to military readiness. He should be sounding general quarters. Instead, he has a party. And he throws the very famous party that uh, uh, becomes a major, major event in world history. Part of the tone of the party was to show arrogance uh, of all kinds, but especially the God of Israel. And he sends his messengers next door to the museum to get the temple vessels, and he uses the temple vessels in the party as a, a gesture of desecration. Now, what? meanwhile, what was going on outside the city is Ugaburu had sent one of his divisions upriver. And at a pre-appointed time, they diverted the Euphrates River into the canal system they controlled. And that caused the water levels of the, the river the, you know, that supplied the motor on Babylon to drop. And the other divisions at the pre-appointed time went in under the gates and took over the city. One of the most incredible scenes in history, of course, is the famous scene during Belshazzar's party. Because while they're taking the temple vessels and having a big field day, you can just... I don't know how Cecil B. DeMille missed this for a movie. It'd be great. A hand, the fingers of a man's hand, started writing on the wall and wrote some cryptic letters. And uh, that tended to put a kind of a gloom on the party, as you can imagine. And I love the King James that places. It says, Belshazzar's knees smote one against the other. Oh. In any case, it shook him up, and uh, his advisors, the experts, came out, and they could not read the writing. And the queen, apparently the wife of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, was still alive in those days, and she called his attention to the fact that there was a guy in Nebuchadnezzar's reign that had a gift for this sort of thing. And so they called Daniel out of retirement. Daniel comes in. They offer him all kinds of rich rewards. He says, keep yours, and gives a little eulogy, saying, insulting the king and explaining how the predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, now there was a king, and he goes up through a little bit of that, which must have been very popular, but... But then he goes on to interpret the letters. And according to the Talmud, the reason he was able to interpret it is that he read them vertically and backwards. But the net of it was, the, the net of that is that uh, he says that your kingdom is weighed and watering, your number is up, and um, this night is the, the kingdom delivered to the Persians. And I won't get through all the details or some puns and other things, but it's amazing, by the way, how many expressions in our language today come from that evening. Handwriting on the wall, have you ever heard that expression? A lot of people use it, never heard, don't know where it comes from. Your number is up, right? And so forth. And all those things, there's, a, there's about eight of them that come out of the Daniel chapter 5. But without getting into all that right now, of course, that night the Persians take over. But here is a key point that everybody misses, and it's vital to you and I. The Persians took over Babylon without a battle. If you visit the London Museum and see the Steel of Cyrus, which is a famous artifact, Cyrus himself on it, my hand, boasts that he captured the world at Babylon without a battle. There was no destruction of Babylon. It was a fall. It took three days for most of the residents to know that the city had been taken over by the Persians. They did not interrupt the temple services, the various things. Persians took over. They owned the place. It's a mix of trying to give you a little bit of history so you can interpret chapter 13, and yet on the other hand, not spend too much time recapping a lot of history. But um, a couple other points I'd like to make that I think are interesting. Uh, Ugaburu, of course, takes over Babylon. It's, uh, I think, 14 days later that Cyrus, the big boss, comes in and makes his appearance, takes over the city. 
And interestingly enough, we understand from the ancient records that Cyrus was presented the scroll of Isaiah, chapter 44 and 45. We'll get into this all in detail when we get to that part there. But the main point is in that portion of Scripture, there is a letter written to Cyrus by name. God says, because I'm calling you by name, even though you don't know who I am, you will thus know that I'm the God of Israel. And the scroll was written 150 years earlier. And by the way, the person, according to, the, I think it's the Talmud, or Josephus, I forget which, that presents the scroll to Cyrus is none other than Daniel. And uh, Cyrus is obviously impressed. I think we all would be, wouldn't you? Find a letter 150 years old calling you by name. And by the way, giving the highlights of your career and some other things. And so uh, Cyrus is impressed. It's a matter of history that he is. And he releases the Jews to go home. Now, what's interesting about this is it's the very day, 70 days, that the captivity started. That's a whole study. But when you go through all that arithmetic, you discover it's the exact day. Now, there's another detail of all of this that I think is worth your consideration. There's a passage in Ezekiel, chapter 4. And for time reasons, we'll go into all the details now. But the gist of it is, is that God says through Ezekiel that there'll be 430 years of judgment on Israel. Now, 70 of those 430 years we know about. That's the Babylonian captivity. If you take 70 from 430, that leaves you 360 years of judgment predicted upon Israel. And those 360 years don't fit any particular passage of history. It's, a, it's, a, it's an awkward interpretive problem. It has been suggested by several that in Leviticus chapter 26, there's four different places where God says, in effect, that if you don't obey me the first time, I'll multiply your punishments by seven. Oh, another piece of history you need to have to get the background here. When Nebuchadnezzar does his first siege, and he makes them all vassals of Babylon and takes some of them slaves, the prophets, that is, I should say, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, preach to the people that Nebuchadnezzar is the instrument of God, that this is God's judgment off the nation. The false prophets surrounding the leadership say nonsense. We're God's chosen people, and God's going to deliver us. And that was a more popular message. Jeremiah says, no, God has told me to tell you that don't expect to be delivered. You're in for 70 years of captivity. And by the way, if you don't yield, God is going to destroy Jerusalem. Well, to make a long story short, Jehoiakim says nonsense. He rebels. Nebuchadnezzar lays a second siege on Babylon, succeeds, replaces Jehoiakim with Zedekiah. And goes back home. And again, Ezekiel from writing from Babylon and Jeremiah writing in, Ju in Jerusalem tells Zedekiah, don't rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. He's the hand of God. In effect, they couldn't swallow that. They're Jewish. He's Gentile. God is going to deliver us and so forth. No. So they rebel also. And by this time, Nebuchadnezzar has a belly full of the whole operation. He sends his troops and not only lays siege, he levels the place, destroys Jerusalem, takes them all slaves. That's the third siege of Nebuchadnezzar. The reason I'm getting into these technicalities is, in the Old Testament, there are two phrases. One is, the servitude of the nation is to be 70 years long, and it was to the very day. It starts from the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar. There's also a phrase, and Daniel uses it and elsewhere, of the desolations of Jerusalem, and they were predicted by Jeremiah to be 70 years long. And because they both smack of the captivity and they're both 70 years long, most scholars treat the servitude of the nation and the desolations of Jerusalem as if they were synonyms. Now, the reason I'm getting into this is this peculiar passage, some, I guess, 10, 15 years ago, this peculiar passage of Ezekiel bothered me, the 430 years, less 70, the 360 years. And, and uh, I ran into this idea that, gee, Leviticus says four times that if you don't obey me the first time, I'll multiply your punishment by seven. Well, if you multiply 360 by seven, you get 2,520 years. And several commentators have noted that that's about the, the duration of the diaspora. That is, from the Babylon captivity coming back, you know, by the time you go through Rome and the fall of Jerusalem in 780 and all that, the Jews get scattered throughout the world. That's been roughly a little over 2,000, cost 2,500 years. Well, I'm always bothered by that. First of all, the whole length seemed a little contrived, but then also there's nothing approximate in God's plan. If we're understanding correct, it's precise to the very day. But what no one had bothered to do was to take the uh, 2,520 years and recognize that God deals in 360-day years for lots of reasons. Sir Robert Anderson discovered that and thus unraveled the Daniel 9, the 70-week prophecy of Daniel and all of that, but no one ever applied that here. So I thought, well, gee, what's 2,520 uh, years if you take 360-day years, the solar year, and that's the 907,200 days, you say, Chuck, that's wonderful. What do I do with that? Well, what you need to do is say, okay, what's that in our calendar? 
Well, that means you've got a, the Julian year is about 11 minutes and 10.46 seconds longer than the mean solar year. And what that all means is you end up having three leap years too many every four centuries. So, And they recognized this in 1752 A.D. They realized they had an 11-day error in our Julian calendar. There was 11 days too many, so they made the 3rd of September of 1752, the 14th of September. In other words, got rid of 11 days, so to speak. They also decided that 1700, 1800, 1900 will be common years, not leap years. The year 2000 will be a leap year. The point is they, they corrected this minor anomaly in our leap year calculations to get the mean solar year in step with this idea of the year and all of that. Well, you say, gee, what do you do with the 2520 years? I mean, that's 907,200 days. How many years and days is that in our calendar? Well, it turns out that's um, 2,483 years. And uh, you have to go through some corrections for the leap years. And without taking you through all of that, it turns out that the 2,520 year, years, by multiplying it out, becomes on our calendar 2,483 years, 9 months, and 21 days. And you say, gee, Chuck, that's really exciting. What do I do with that? Well, your next problem is, okay, when do you start counting? Well, it's interesting because the servitude of the nation started with the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, and it lasted 70 years. But remember, those are 360-day years, so that's six, actually 69 years and two days. That means that that ended on July 23rd of 537 B.C. And if you count 2,483 years, nine months and 21 days, from the servitude of the nation, Israel, you come to May 14th of 1948, the very day that David Ben-Gurion announced to the world that the new Jewish homeland was going to be called Israel, May 14th of 1948. All the arguments that were still going through, I, I appear on KKLA and get into a talk show, and the amillennials crawl out of the woodwork. You take the Bible literally. I says, I take the Bible seriously. And they didn't know how to deal with that one. But... But the, all those arguments should have ended on May 14th of 1948, because up till then you could argue this, that, and the other thing. But, hey, Israel is. It's there. Go visit it. See it. Feel it. And they're going to start pulling the temple. Come on, get serious, gang. But that's interesting. I don't want to oversell this. The point is, that's an interesting situation. There are lots of controversies about the details I'm going through. I'm not boring you with all that stuff right now. But it's interesting, if you count this period of time that Ezekiel predicts from the servitude of the nation's completion, you come to May 14th of 1948, okay, and I say, what a coincidence, and the rabbis say coincidence is not a kosher word. Now, all this hangs around Babylon, Babylon captivity. The Babylon captivity ended by Babylon being conquered by the Medes and the Persians, but the fact I'd like you just to trust me is important, is that the Persians did not do it with a they didn't they did not destroy the city, they conquered it. It became their capital. A couple of hundred years later. In Greece rises another young, promising, fantastic leader by the name of Alexander, who conquers the known world all the way to India. And I think, what was it, at the age of 29, he fell on his bed and wept because there were no more worlds he knew to conquer. Alexander the Great. What was his capital? Babylon. He conquered, you know, he conquered the Persians. Babylon was still a city. He was going to make it his primary capital. He had plans to make it a harbor with a thousand ships. That's all the way up the Euphrates. That's a big deal. He passed away in Babylon. So it never got fulfilled. His four generals said on his deathbed, who, who do you give the empire to? He says, give it to the strong. Boy, what a dumb thing to do. So they spent next century fighting over it, the four guys. The point is Babylon was inhabited for several centuries, after the Persians, after the Greece. In fact, even in 100 AD, there are still merchants there, and there's a priestly school. Babylon atrophies. It disappears from prominence on the world scene because one of the four generals created a, a city called Seleucia, which was more close to some trade routes, and because of its dominance, Babylon starts to decline the, uh, in a merchant sense, and it erodes away from history. Well, I'll come to some of that. Let's get back to Isaiah and see how this all, why this is all so important to you and I. But the first thing we notice that the burden of Babylon, Babylon's going to be destroyed here, but we notice, first of all, it says the tumultuous, in verse 4, the tumultuous noise of kingdoms of nations gathered together, plural, lots of them. Some of the commentators as well, they were conquered by the Medes and the Persians, a coalition between the Medes and the Persians. And by the way, the Medes were uh, uh, allies of Babylon when they, got, when they were against Assyria for a while, but the Medes and the Persians were against Babylon, conquered Babylon. And we're going to discover the Medes are going to surface in verse 17. I'll leave those remarks till I get there. Let's move on. Uh, my suggestion is these are kingdoms of nations. It's plural. I think it's more than just the Medes and the Persians, personally, but we'll go on. 
The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. So this is God's hand in here. Verse 5, they come from a far country, from the end of heaven. Hey, come on, guys. Persia's next door. What do you mean the end of heaven? Something else is going on. Even the Lord and his weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Now, up till now, it's just been suggestive. But the next few verses are going to remove all doubt as to this having happened historically. Verse 6, Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. Wait a minute now. The day of the Lord, that's a familiar phrase to us students of the Old Testament. That's the day when God pours out his wrath, wrath upon the earth. That's the wrap-up. That's Armageddon. That's the close of the 70th week of Daniel. There's all, that's clearly yet future, as you'll see in a minute. So what, he, what Isaiah is talking about is never been fulfilled. This is not the fall of Babylon to the Persians. This is something else, yet sure. Why am I making such a thing of this? Because the Bible requires the city of Babylon to be a major world power at the time of the end. Why is that meaningful to you and I? Because for 19 years, Saddam Hussein has been rebuilding the city of Babylon. The U.S. press does not have the biblical perception to understand its relevance. They think that just some ceremonial buildings, and they're right, by the way. If you visited there, you'd probably be quite disappointed. There are some temples and some buildings, but it's not a big deal yet, but it is being rebuilt. The Palace of Nebuchadnezzar has been rebuilt. Most of the major key temples have been rebuilt. The, procession, the famous processional way has been rebuilt. And, you know, it's, it's a, the point is it's starting and the Bible, when you recognize that, you realize that these passages are not, not allegorical or symbolic. They're literal. Let's move on. See what else it says. Well, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be, like in, be, be in pain like a woman that travaileth. There's that expression. Those of you that are students of prophecy recognize that expression that these judgments, these pains, come like labor pains. That sounds familiar to you from Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and elsewhere. A very common expression in prophecy dealing with the final, with the end time. They shall be amazed one another, the faces shall be as flames. Behold, there it is again, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners out of it. Oh, really? Destroy the sinners out of it? That's interesting. You think that's interesting? Look at verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellation, the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be dark and it's going forth. The moon shall not cause its light to shine. And we'll find out in verse 13 that the, it's going to, the earth is going to be removed out of its orbit. Has that happened so far? Not so you'd notice. Verse 11, and I will punish the world for its evil. Wait a minute, I thought this was judgment on Babylon. The pride of the Chaldeans, this, this place on the on plain of Shinar, 62 miles south of Baghdad. No, no, I will punish the world. God can't punish the world until he's ready to punish all of it. That's why Jesus Christ, when he opened his ministry, quoting Isaiah chapter 61, first two verses, stopped at a comma. I'll publish tidings and heal the sick and so forth. But he, stopped. he didn't go beyond the comma which said, and the day of vengeance of our God, God wasn't ready yet. Praise God, if he was, you and I wouldn't be saved. I punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Has that happened yet? Because I know a few he's missed. Verse 12, and I will make a man more rare than fine gold, than a man, than the golden wedge of Ephraim. It says here that the very existence of man will be threatened. Nowhere in history has the entire existence of the human race on the earth been threatened, like it is today. Like it is today. Soviet Union submarines hold them hostage, 12,000 cities. We don't know where they are. They've got uh, 64 Typhoon-class submarines, each one with 20 tubes, each tube with each missile with uh, 10 independently targeted warheads, and uh, no way to stop it. And that's just their side. Now, you put our side on that. We have about half as much, but enough. We only have 6,000 cities. Get serious, gang. Right now, today, as we talk, the world is in jeopardy. We tend to dismiss that with all the other euphoria because of the 100-hour war, wonderful, and there's all this peace and safety being talked about. First Thessalonians tells us about that. When they say peace and safety, then come its sudden destruction. Move on, verse 13. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth 
and the earth shall remove out of its place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be like the chaste roe, and like a sheep that no man taketh up. They shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one into his own land. By the way, that verse 14 is kind of a strange verse. It implies that some of the sheep have been taken up, some are left. So you chew on that one. If you're pre-trip, you can jump on that one and say, whoa, great. But it's not conclusive. I just throw it as a side. But verse 15, everyone that is found shall be thrust through, and everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. The children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. The houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them who shall not regard silver as for gold. They shall not delight in. In other words, the Medes are involved, but not for, not, not for money, not for spoil. Now, because the Medes are mentioned in 17, many commentators assume that this refers to the Medes and Persians conquering Babylon in 539 B.C. Nonsense. No way has this happened in the past. You read the past, there's no way you can contrive the, this passage to have been fulfilled historically. It hasn't happened yet. What are the Medes doing here? Well, let's talk about the Medes a minute. Who are the Medes? The Medes were a nation in the western corner of Elam, Iran, Persia, and north and also on the eastern edge of Iraq. You and I know the Medes as the Kurds. How do the Kurds feel about the Babylonians? Saddam Hussein used their chemical we his chemical weapons on their women and children to make a point. His guess, their, their, their women and children, his point. But um, how do the Medes feel about Iraq? Doesn't take any insight to visualize, yes, indeed, they'll be stirred up against them, and they're not for silver or gold. The bow shall dash the young men to pieces. There's that word again, bows. Bows and arrows are King James English. The Hebrew word are launchers and missiles. Their bow shall dash the young men to pieces. They shall have no pity in the fruit of the womb, and their eyes shall not spare the children. Now, verse 19, And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellency, is this mystical Babylon? Is this symbolic? Is this allegorical? No, it's the pride of the Chaldeans' excellency. Who was the Chaldeans? The people that dwelt in Shinar, the plain of Shinar. This is talking literal, traditional Babylon. How can it be? It's talking yet future. Babylon has to be rebuilt, and it is as we speak. And, and it shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. How did God overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah? Genesis 18 and 19. Fire from heaven. Now, geez, that missiles and nuclear weapons could be. I'm not going to push that point. The main point is it hasn't happened in history. Verse 20, after this happens, that is this, talking about it, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelled in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. That's kind of interesting. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. That one's got nothing to do with Arabia. Arabia is a long way to the south. How did Isaiah know that the Arabians would be a dominant factor in our day? That's kind of interesting in itself, isn't it? In any case, though, it'll never, Babylon will never be inhabited. Has it been inhabited? Yes. When Col Dewey, the famous German excavator in the turn of the century, uh, excavated Babylon, he was able to hire Arabs from the four villages that sit there on Babylon. The village of Hilla had 10,000 occup occupants as late as the late 1800s. It was a, So this says it'll never be inhabited. That means that destruction is talked about is yet future. But while beasts of the desert shall lie there, their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. Ostriches shall dwell there, and there's some doubt about the translation. And the he goats shall dance there. Now, the he goats is a strange phrase because it also may mean demons. It's a, that's a whole side study. And the wild beasts of the coastland shall cry in their desolate houses, and the jackals in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. And let's continue at verse 14, down to verse 11. We'll leave uh, verse 12 on for a special study next time. We've got enough spooky stuff for one night. Chapter 14, verse 1, The Lord shall have mercy on Jacob, and yet choose Israel. Notice, Jacob and Israel, that's the nation, and set them in their own land. See, that's happened. And the sojourners shall be joined with them, and they shall cling to the house of Jacob, and the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. Really? And they shall take them captives, whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, and from thy fear, and from hard bondage, in which thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt 
take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath in a continual stroke, he who ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet, and they break forth into singing. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no hewers come up against us. So a very poetic way of Isaiah giving comfort, if you will, to Israel. Bear in mind he's writing before they're going to be slaves and be oppressed, so they can cling to these words, knowing the day will come when the, the tables will be turned, if you will. Verse 9, Sheol from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Oh, what does that say? Is that poetic language, or is there something really spooky going on here? Those of you that want to chase this trail down to its conclusion, I commend to you a study of Daniel chapter 10. We'll talk about that next time for some other reasons. Verse 10, all they, uh, all they uh, shall speak and say to thee, Art thou become as weak as we? These are down in Sheol. That means the shades that are down there greeting their visitors can express themselves. Apparently some of the things that makes uh, Sheol or Hades or whatever you want to call it um, disturbing to the, um, the unblessed is that they can understand what they're missing and they can communicate their lack of hope to one another. Art thou become as weak as we are? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to Sheol, the noise of thy lutes, and the worm is spread over thee, and the worms cover thee. Now there's their maggot ridden, and all it goes. You, get, you think that's grim. Wait till next time, it's going to get worse. Um, we will talk about the origin, career, and destiny of one of the angels. The only angel, to my knowledge, that allowed himself to be worshipped, other than Jesus Christ, of course. The angel, in the sense that the angel of the Lord often refers to him. We know only of three angels that have names Michael, Gabriel, and this one is going to, Isaiah is going to give some glimpses into. Gabriel is always messianic. We know his job description by searching the Bible and seeing every place he's mentioned. is always on a messianic mission. And Daniel is giving the exact day that Jesus Christ is going to present himself as king, and he does to the very day. And uh, it's Gabriel that tells Mary about the forthcoming child and so on. The other one has a name as Michael, always a warrior, and always, always fighting militarily on behalf of Israel. And there's a third one. By the name of Lucifer. We'll talk about him next time. Not, we won't take our time tonight on that subject, but that's why we'll cut it off uh, tonight at, at verse 11. The other passages that are um, worth summarizing, in the interest of time, we won't go into it in uh, too much detail, but it might be good just to hit the highlights. See, let's turn to Jeremiah 50. And just, they're longer chapters, so we don't have time to really do it in depth, but we can zip through to give you some of the flavor of it. And I'll give you some insights and also let you chew on some questions. Jeremiah 15, 51. Again, 50 opens up. The word of the Lord spoke against Babylon and against the land of Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare among the nations and so on. And it mentions her idols and so forth. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her. Oh, that's interesting. From the north. Who's north of Babylon? While we get home, look at a globe. Soviet Union. And, the, and so forth. And uh, they're gonna, uh, Israel will be not only regathered, but in belief, because the covenant is good. And that's a whole other insight. But get to verse 8. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans, and be as he goats before the flocks, and so forth. For law I raise up and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. And on it goes. It down to verse 13, because of the wrath of the Lord, shall not, it shall not be inhabited. There is that theme again. And the walls are thrown down, verse 15. That has not happened. Yes, they eroded historically, but this, this kind of destruction has never occurred. And on it goes. And we get to 19. We talk about the Golan Heights, and so we'll get to that right here. Verse 25, against the land of the Chaldeans. It's not allegorical, it's literal. Verse 34 is kind of fun. Speaking of Israel, it says, the Redeemer is strong. We happen to know his name. Israel doesn't yet, but they'll learn. Get down to chapter, verse 39, the wild beasts of the desert and so forth. And it shall no more be inhabited forever, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. That has never happened. It's God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. There's that phrase again in Jeremiah. And their neighboring cities, said the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell in her. 
And it could be, behold, a people shall come from the north. Notice verse 41. Behold, a people shall come from the north and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the borders of the earth. Now, many people got overly excited about these passages during the Hundred Hour War in the recent Persian Gulf crisis. And on the one hand, the good news is they began to recognize that literal Babylon was happening. So that was good. And yet, and it, certainly there were many kings and people came from the borders of the earth. We were there, etc. But did this happen as described here? No, it didn't. Don't try to twist it that it did. No, the destruction it's talking about here is not the destruction that happened to... And by the way, don't confuse Iraq with Babylon. Don't confuse Iraq with Assyria. You say, well, gee, that's the same geography. No, it isn't. You take the Babylonian, you take the Babylon Empire... Take the Assyrian Empire, take the Babylonian Empire, take the Persian Empire, and lay out the empires, and the borders are not that different. So you're talking empires, not just the city, if you follow me. So don't be confused by that. Just watch the paper, and it'll all unfold. When you get to chapter 51, there's a few other things. We start seeing other imagery here. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. That idiom is going to be in, the, in Revelation 17, 18. Nations have drunk her wine. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. We're going to see it in Revelation. Babylon has fallen, fallen, and so forth. Verse 11 is interesting. It ends with the Lord and the vengeance of his temple. That's interesting. Let's pop over to Revelation 17 and 18. In the idioms and the symbols and the graphs and, the, and, and what have you of Revelation, we encounter a strange thing called Mystery Babylon in chapter 17 and 18. Mystery Babylon is a great harlot. Now, Babylon, the city of Babylon is the source. Something else you should just be aware of is background. The city of Babylon is the origin of most of what we consider in the world. Numbers, accounting, the signs of the zodiac, all, almost every place you turn, the more you know about Babylon, the more you'll be amazed at how much we confront in our world system. How many minutes in an hour? Anyone? 60. Good for you. Okay. How many, how many seconds in a minute? How many hours in a day? How many days in a year? 360, actually, the original one, the original year before 71 BC. Now, the question is that all came from Babylon. How many degrees in a circle? 360. Babylon, Babylon, Babylon. All that started in Babylon. More importantly, what about things like the Easter Bunny? The goddess of Babylon was Ishtar. The fertility symbol was the egg. Another fertility symbol, of course, are rabbits because they multiply so quickly, and those idioms get commingled in what we call the Easter. You ever wonder why an Easter Bunny lays eggs? Babylon. It's a, it's a strange convolution of those ancient thoughts, ideas, conceptions. The idea of the Christmas tree, Babylon, nothing to do with Christianity. The Babylonians worshipped the sun god. Nimrod had a wife by the Simramas, and they promoted the, the myth that their son, Tammuz, was supernaturally born. Tammuz was associated with the sun god. By the way, first letter of his name was a T, which in Babylon and Chaldean looks like a cross, incidentally. But the point is, is that uh, he was associated with the sun god, and the sun god was worshipped about the time of the winter solstice. As the days got shorter and shorter, he was thought to have died, and as the days started to get longer, he was thought to have been reborn. And they celebrated the death and rebirth of the sun god by taking a log, burning it in the fireplace. The Chaldean name for infant is Yule. And the... Um, <laughs> I sure hope not, yeah. <laughs> And what they did is they burned a log in the fireplace that night, and the next morning they replaced it with a trimmed tree. And that celebrated the death and rebirth of Tammuz. And that, that legend was the route to a celebration in the Babylonian system. When the Babylonians get conquered by the Persians, that system moves to Pergamus. That's why Jesus Christ, in his letter to, for letter of church at Pergamus, could speak of Sir Pergamus as where Satan's seat is. When the Romans conquer, all the, the Greeks conquer, and the Romans conquer the Greeks, this whole system and the priesthood associated with it moves to Rome. And most of what we know about pagan Rome has its origin in Babylon. You substitute the Chaldean names with Latin names, and you've got uh, Ishtar becoming Aphrodite or Astarte, and you've got all these ch name changes, but the same, same thoughts, same concepts, and they celebrated the, the Tammuz ritual in Saturnalia. A couple of centuries later, Constantine be, makes Christianity the official religion, a very shrewd political maneuver for lots of reasons. The population, anxious to comply with the emperor, anxious to play Christian. But obviously they're used to celebrating certain things, so they rename it, adapt their cultural traditions to the new regime. And so Saturnalia becomes, of course, what we know as Christmas. Not quite under the winter solstice. They missed it by a couple of days. Not December 22nd. It's actually December 25th, but close. 
And uh, on it goes. We know Christ was not born in December. Couldn't be. He had to be born when Judea was passable. Jesus says, pray that your flight be not in winter. Judea is not passable in the winter. It snows there, believe it or not. And you got pictures. By the way, I've seen pictures of Jerusalem under snowfall. It's kind of interesting, but not very often, but it does happen. Point is, though, that uh, Jesus, the shepherds were uh, in open field, and they don't do that after October. So Jesus Christ was born probably on Rosh Hashanah. And that's a whole other thing. Anyway, getting back to Babylon. Babylon is the mother of all false religion. These ancient weird ideas are now packaged with new popularity under the label New Age. They call it channelers. Babylon called it mediums, mystics, spiritists, and on, onward. Verse uh, 3 in Revelation 17. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. The woman is not the beast. She sits on the beast. Don't confuse the woman with the beast. Full of names and blasphemy and having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed with in purple and scarlet color and bedecked with gold and precious stones and pearls and having a golden cup in her hand. There's that golden cup from Jeremiah, by the way. Full of abominations and filthiness and fornication. And here's her identity. Verse 5. The bonner head was a na name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. Hey, Babylon wasn't drunk with the blood of the saints. So what's going on here? This is something broader, something bigger than literal past Babylon. See, woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Oh, really? Sounds like we're mixing some metaphors here, doesn't it? And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonder. Okay. Why would John wonder? If John thought Mystery Babylon was simply Rome, he wouldn't be puzzled. He'd understand it completely. He's puzzled. Now, don't misunderstand me. As you study this carefully, you will find an amazing link between much of this and idol worship in many denominations, not just the Catholics that get picked on so badly by expositors, Book of Revelation. But indeed, much of the traditions of the Catholic Church have the roots in Babylon, not the, the, the Scripture. And it goes on to talk about this. But the point I'd like to get across is not to hammer the Catholics to get your horizons broader than just the papacy. It's not that simple, my friends. It will exhaust our time to try to analyze this whole passage. But if you do this properly, and I commend to you a study of the book of Revelation, 52 chapters, to, to really get into this. And if some of you are Catholic and troubled by this, let me give you some refuge. In the seven letters of seven churches, of course, Jesus Christ lays out a number of things, one of which is all of church history. And the fourth letter is the letter to church at Thyatira, which clearly can be linked to the papacy. But if the Protestants are giving you a hard time, if the Thyatira is the papacy, then Sardis is the Reformation. And the Sardis is one of the two letters of the seven that has no good said about it. So if you Catholics or back Catholic background want to fend off some of your Protestant critics, uh, give them a lesson in the, le in the Church of Sardis, and that will set their clock for a while. But the truth of the matter is, Babylon, mystery Babylon, the harlot, is more than just the literal city of Babylon, the pride of the Chaldeans, excellency. Somehow there's something, what, what mystery Babylon involves is the whole religious tradition of the earth mingled together. It may have overtones of the papacy, it overtones of the New Age, and so forth. We know from Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, that the son of perdition, the man of sin, will exalt himself above all that is called God. And that's not just the Pope, it's Islam, it's the New Age, it's every, all that is God, he's going to exalt himself above all that is called God or his worship. You and I don't have the capacity to imagine that, but it's coming. And it may even have extraterrestrial overtones, who knows? Question then is, okay, Chuck, gee, I, I, I'm, I'm getting a little overwhelmed. Uh, uh, we've got this chapter 17, 18, and that's a heavy step. We could, we could easily spend several hours just in those two chapters. But as I do, what you come up with is a commingling of, gee, I've got clearly a link to Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 15 and 51. I understand that. I, I've got that clear. And yet I'm confused because I've got something that's not just Chaldean here. I've got something that's global. How do I reconcile those? Let me give you a possibility. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 5. This will have the benefit because it will help you find a book you may not have looked at before, Zechariah. If nothing else, it will sell tabs at the bookstore. Zechariah chapter 5. And Zechariah is full of incredible little tidbits. Some of these prophets have big, huge, sweeping visions, and some of these guys have these... Uh, Fast, well, Zechariah is actually some of both, but in any case, chapter 5, he's got a couple of things, and, and uh, again, in the interest of time, I'll take just the second issue. 
It starts at verse 5, a strange little vision that Zechariah records for us. It's much overlooked by most commentators. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5, Zechariah says, The angel who talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. It's interesting, the lift up thine eyes phrase, it's an entry study in its own right. Every major event in Abram's life was, was preambled by that phrase. So some of these things are like little signposts and triggers to those of you that are really the you know, careful students of the Scripture, but we'll just move on and get the gist of it. Verse 6, and, as, and Zechariah says, And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. And he said, Moreover, this is the resemblance throughout all the earth. Now, what on earth is an ephah? You and I don't encounter an ephah every other day. It was the largest dry commercial measure. I think it's seven bushels, if I recall. In any case, Verse 7, And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. Now, a talent was a unit of weight. The ephah was the largest volume measure in the commercial practice. The talent was the heaviest weight measure in commercial practice, approximately 97 pounds. This is a talent of lead. Behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. So, the first overtone of this is commercialism. We've got the largest commercial dry measure and the largest weight measure, used as a lid or a seal. What are they sealing in this big jar? Verse 7, Behold, there was lifted up a town of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth of it. Kind of a strange vision. Maybe it's a vision, of course. It's just an idiom we're dealing in here. But we've got a large ephah. We've got a woman trapped inside, sealed in because the lid's put on it. Now, who is this woman? It says so in verse 8. This is wickedness. My conjecture, my suggestion for your consideration is I believe that this woman is the harlot of Revelation 17 and 18. Not only because she's labeled this way, but for some other reasons as we'll develop as we go. Zechariah con uh, continues in verse 9, Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, these are different women now, two women, and the, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between he earth and heaven. Well, it's obviously symbolic. It's a vision, but okay. You remember now, Zechariah is a priest. He's a Jew. This is in the Old Testament. Part of your perception here, you've got to sort of think like a rabbi. A stork is an unclean bird. In the lists in Deuteronomy, a stork is unclean. Ceremonial, this means something wrong with it, just uh, ceremonially unclean, in the ecclesiastical sense. So these two women are not like angels' wings. They have wings like a stork. So this would, to the Jewish mind, create a sinister coloration of the whole thing. You follow me? Okay, they had wings like his wings of a stork. They lifted up the ephah between earth and heaven. Verse 10, then said I to the angel who talked with me, where do these bear the ephah? So here's the woman trapped inside this commercial measure with a commercial lid on top of it, being carried by unclean messengers somewhere. It's between heaven and earth, which gives it a more than a tangible, it's, you know, it's allegorical in some way. Verse 11, They said unto me, To build for it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon its own base. Now, what's the land of Shinar? The word Shinar appears seven times in the Bible. It's a synonym of Babylon. Shinar is the general area that Babylon sits in. In our parlance, we'd consider if Babylon's the city, Shinar's the county or something. You follow me? The plain of Shinar is the general location. Of, in other words, this strange goings-on is returning something back to its original base. Where? On the Euphrates River in Shinar. That's because of this rather cryptic but provocative vision that it suggests the following resolution to the issue of what is Babylon all about. Babylon, literal Babylon, is being rebuilt as we speak in Iraq. It is not a target during the 100-hour war because it's not a military target. Some ceremonial buildings. And I haven't kept track lately. I don't have any special G2, but I assume that they're, they will, when he can, continue rebuilding. If not Saddam Hussein, then his successor. Okay. When Babylon is destroyed, as described in Isaiah 13 and 14, 
at Jeremiah 15:51. It is a major world center. It's not just a little burg on the Euphrates. And Revelation makes it the climax of God's judgment upon the earth. Poetically, it makes sense because all that God hates started there. All false religion, all false worship, Babylon. It migrates to become the world system. How interesting it is, apparently the Bible describes it evolving back to its location. The city of Babylon, apparently, is going to reemerge not just as a provocative city in Iraq, but a major world center. How can that be? Take a compass, put the point of it on the point 62 miles south of Baghdad, where Babylon sits, and draw a circle of 500,000 miles. And you get most of the world's oil reserves. Can it emerge as an economic center? You bet. Can it emerge as a major religious center? Boy, make the world religion new age and see what happens. Okay, and, and so forth. And the church, I believe, for lots of reasons is out of here, so that really opens the door. The hinderer will be taken out of the way. I'm going to leave you then with the assignment to read Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 15, 51, and the Revelation 17, 18. I realize we touched it lightly and went through a little bit of it. And obviously there's an enormous uh, a lot a little more that you get into. Those of you that might want to track down a copy of the Rise of Babylon, the Persian Gulf Crisis, the bookstore has it for those of you who want to chase that down, which has all these calculations and strange, bizarre conjectures of Chuck Bistler. You can chase that on your own. But let me shift gears a little bit because we still have a few more minutes and I want to uh, change the subject, sort of. What do you do about all this? What do you do about all this? You know, we sit here and we have some fun and we get in the scripture, and that's always fun. If you get into the scripture, it's always a treasure. God always has a surprise for you, and it's exciting. But what do you do about it? Well, for one thing, it's my suggestion, strongly, that you learn your Bible. I don't know what the future holds. I know who holds the future. It's a big difference. Amen is right. You betcha. Now, so first of all, over the next few months and few years, do your homework. Find out what an Arab is. If you find that out, write it down. It's a moving target. It's not a son of Ishmael. The proudest Arabs are the son of the third wife of Abraham, Keturah. It's not genealogical. It's not territorial. What most, what, what the press means when they speak of Arabs is not Arabs at all. They include Turkey and North Africa and a lot of other things. Those aren't Arabs. They're Muslims. They're united by only one thing. They're con combined hate for Israel. That's supernatural for lots of reasons. We've studied that. Point is, though, you won't really understand what's going to unfold in the next, the next number of months unless you really know your Bible. So first of all, this is the time. Do your homework. Find out what the Bible says. Now, I mean really, not because I said so. I hope not. Do your own, I hope my main motive is to get you stimulated enough to do your own digging. But what you will find out, the Bible lays out some very interesting things to happen just before God wraps up his dramatic final curtain on planet Earth. He says a super state is going to emerge in Europe. It's happening before our very eyes. And don't equate Europe with Western Europe. The Roman Empire was East and West. Notice what's happening in the Eastern Bloc. You talk about realignments. That's fascinating. Does it take a long time? How long did it take for the Berlin Wall to come down? Boy, that's when, when it moves, it moves quickly in spurts like labor pains. That's kind of interesting. Bible says Europe will emerge as a super state. It's got three times the population of the United States. It's happening as we speak. And that's a whole other study for some evening. Bible says that the Soviet Union is going to be the major source of arms to an Arab bloc to invade Israel. Ezekiel details it. It's ready to happen as we speak. Bible says that God is going to regather Israel. As Isaiah said in chapter 11, the second time. We're watching it happen the second time. The time that God talks about as we speak. Bible says that they're going to come from the Soviet Union and from Ethiopia specifically. And as we speak, that's happening in such at such a rate that Israel can hardly absorb them as we speak. The Bible, God describes what he's uh, doing in advance. Amos 3.7 says he will do nothing but that which he's revealed to his servants the prophets. It's all there if we look for it. Okay, there's Europe, there's the Soviet Union, there's Israel. The Bible says at the time of the end, there's going to be a temple built. And we've hammered that one home. It's happening as we speak. They're training the priests. They're building the implements. They haven't done the brick and mortar yet, but they're setting the groundwork. So it's, it's unfolding. 
The Bible says that at the end time, the city of Babylon is going to reemerge on the world scene to be a major power to be destroyed by God himself. And for centuries, Bible scholars of all persuasions have generally, not always, been a few exceptions, but in general have seen this as allegorical because they presume that the destruction of Babylon described by Isaiah and Jeremiah happened in 539 B.C. Not if you read it carefully. Now, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't take the Bible seriously and you symbolize all this stuff, you'll miss it. As I've often said, if you torture the passages long enough, they'll confess. But if you just read it the way Daniel, when Daniel read Jeremiah, he took it literally. De Daniel, Jeremiah said 70 years, Daniel knew it was 70 years to the day. Says so. And do any praise. And so forth. Every time someone reads the Bible in the Bible, he always takes it literally. So why don't we just read it and take it literally? I don't, I'm not badgering figures of speech, of course, but I'm saying, take it for what it says. Babylon's going to be rebuilt and be a major world power. And we look over our shoulder and discover that for the last 19 years, unnoticed by our press, it's been happening. A few little articles in our press figure it's just a tourist attraction or something. <laughs> Let's see. Let's just watch and see. But the real thing I want to drive home is, what are you and I going to do about it? One of the things I suggest is you learn your Bible. Learn your Bible. Well, gee, I read it every day devotionally. Praise God, that's great, but that's a different thing. You need to read it every day to feed your soul, to give God an opportunity to speak to you on the specific issues in your life, and he will, supernaturally, through the Scripture. That's the other half duplex of the communication channel. You pray to him and he'll speak to you. And generally, not always, generally he speaks to you through his word. That's devotional reading. I'm all for that. I'm talking about something else. Make the Bible your hobby. I put that in quotes. Attack it with the intensity that you attack your cameras, your model airplanes, your hunting, fishing. You know, everybody has hobbies. Make the Bible your hobby. Dig into it. Go to a bookstore and pick up a commentary at some book you always want to dig into. Get some help. Find out what, if you don't have a concordance, go get a Strong's or a Young's, whichever you prefer, and get to know how to use it. It's easy. It's fun. Opens up the, allows you to find things you can only half remember. Boy, is that useful. If you don't have a good Bible dictionary, get either a one or one of the five volumes. They're, they're, they're not expensive. Instead of going to dinner tonight and blowing 20 bucks, go get a book. Probably, and, and, I, and I personally don't go to discount houses. I do for some things, not, not Christian books. I have not met a Christian bookstore owner that's rich. I go where there's inventory, where you can select. That's what I like about the chapel store. Commentaries don't turn over. The other little popular books do. That's where they make their margin. You know, most bookstores make their margin. I don't traffic in those particularly. But I love commentaries. But it takes a store with real commitment to carry an inventory. I go where the inventory is. And heaven forbid I even pay retail price. That's what my rabbi's friends tell me. That's what a Gentile is. Somebody has to pay retail. <laughs> Study the scripture. Learn your Bible. And I mean really attack it. And it's a different kind of reading than just reading. You should do that too. That's part of your, your feeding yourself. But I'm suggesting that you intensely find out. Get through Daniel. Understand Daniel 9, the 70 weeks. Understand Daniel 2 and 7 so that you can understand what's going on in Europe today. And so forth. And the very fact that you're here tonight going through Isaiah is, is, is obviously a step in the right direction. <laughs>